Hi, I'm Pam Taub. I'm a cardiologist and professor of medicine at UC San Diego, and I am here today with the one and only Steve Nissen, who needs no introduction, and we're going to talk about the future of lipid management. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Steve Nissen. Uh, my current role is as Chief Academic Officer of the Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. So Steve, you've really had a front row seat to the evolution of lipid lowering medications. You've been in charge of such amazing landmark clinical trials. So I wanna get your insights on some of the new medications that have been approved from the FDA, such as inclycerin and benpidoic acid. But before we talk about these medications, I wanted to get your perspective on just the concept of plaque stabilization versus plaque regression. You showed very elegantly in the reversal study with a torvastatin 80 milligrams that there was stabilization of plaque with statins. Then you showed in Glagov with a PCSK9 inhibitor, evolacumab, that there was plaque regression. So what do you think contributes to plaque regression? Is it the LDL or is it the agent that you use? Well, I think it's all about the LDL. Uh, my own view is that for any given degree of LDL reduction, all of the things being equal, you're going to get the same result. When we started this work in the late 1990s, there was a raging debate. Uh, the argument had been made by a number of people, particularly in Boston, that lowering LDL below 125 milligrams per deciliter had no incremental benefit. And that was based upon a post hoc analysis of the CARE trial. We felt differently. And so we designed the reversal trial. We got an LDL of 110 in a, with a dose of 40 milligrams of pravastatin and 79 milligrams per deciliter with high dose of torvastatin. And there was neither regression nor, nor progression with the high dose of torvastatin, but there was clear cut unequivocal progression with the uh, LDL at 110 with pravastatin. So we knew that at least over that range that LDL was better. What then happened is a series of trials that marched us to a lower and lower level. Uh, asteroid trial, which came around 2005, got LDLs down to 60 milligrams per deciliter. And that was the first of our studies to show unequivocal regression. And then amazingly, with a powerful agent like avalokumab, we got down to an LDL of 36, and there was even more regression. And so our position has been that lower is better. We did do a meta-analysis of all of the trials. Steve Nichols was the first author, published it in JAMA. And what it showed was that the, the line of progression regression crosses zero at about 60 milligrams per deciliter. You go much below that and you see less plaque at the end of 18 to 24 months. If you're above 60, then you may see stabilization or you may even see progression, but you're not likely to see regression. So you're saying an LDL less than 60 is what we need to target for plaque regression. Is well, that I do. Yeah, I do think that's true. And I've been frustrated with the guidelines. I've been very vocal about that. You know, they're very conservative. They don't necessarily take into account all of the data that are available. And, you know, I don't like the fact that targets are gone. You're supposed to give a high intensity statin. And I call it a fire and forget strategy. Uh, because I do think that it may be for some high risk people whose LDLs are, you know, 65, even 60, that they would do better with another agent added on or a different drug uh, because they're going to get into trouble sooner or later. And while we don't have unequivocal evidence comparing 65 milligrams to 35 milligrams, I think that the regression progression data tell us that there are real benefits to going lower.
Yeah, and in my patients, I always aim for LDLs less than 60. So that brings us to two recent trials. One is Huygens, in which the LDL was in the mid 20s. And that was another study with a PCSK9 inhibitor, evolacumab. And what that study showed is in, in addition to decrease in the volume of the plaque, there was an increase in the fibrous cap thickness. So really contributing to plaque stability in a post ACS population. And then there was another study, the Pac-Man AMI trial, again, where the LDL was in the 20s, also showing thickness in the fibrous cap. So the question is for our post ACS patients, should we be targeting an LDL in the 20s based on these studies? Well, first of all, I do believe the studies, I think they were both very well done. I was actually on the executive committee for Huygens and it was done by my former postdoc, Dr. Nichols, who has now come into his own very nicely. And, you know, I think when you get lower and lower, you, you see a number of things happen. Not only do the, do the lipid rich plaques regress, but there is a change in this fibrous cap, which at least some people have linked to plaque vulnerability. Now I'm very careful about that term plaque vulnerability because I think the jury is still out, but uh, it seems to be a good thing to have a thicker fibrous cap, to be more resistant to plaque fracture or erosion with subsequent thrombosis leading to an event. And if you've had one event, the likelihood of having another event is much, much higher. And so what you're arguing for here, and I agree with you completely, is once you've had a, a, an acute event, you know, getting to the lowest LDL you can to protect those patients against a recurrent event makes a lot of sense. So what do you target for your post ACS patients? What I tell everybody, patients, colleagues, and others, that I believe that what guidelines should say is get your patients to the lowest LDL that you can achieve safely without adverse effects. And, you know, we know that we have patients with LDLs in the single digits. They seem fine. We have people with, uh, that are born with LDLs that low and, and have them for their entire lifetime and they have normal reproductive, you know, uh, physiology, everything looks okay. So if you can get there without causing harm, uh, that's good. There's only, the only downside that I see is the slight uptick in diabetes with high intensity statin administration. But pointedly, those patients, even if they have an increase in their hemoglobin A1C, have the same reduction in morbidity mortality. So there's really not a downside to getting to very, very low levels. And I counsel patients and we make what you know, everybody you now calls shared decision making. We talk about it. I show them the articles and we decide together what to target. So speaking of new agents and the, the whole issue around new onset diabetes, benfidoic acid is a fascinating molecule. It acts upstream to HMG-CoA reductase on ATP citrate lyase. And clinically, it doesn't have a lot of the musculoskeletal side effects of statins. And I think it's very interesting how it lowers high sensitivity CRP, and it doesn't have the impact of increasing glucose levels. So can you talk a little bit more about the mechanism and what you think is unique about benthodoic acid? Well, you outlined several of the unique features, and I agree with you. Uh, the LDL lowering is modest. So, you know, it's probably a bit more than azetamide, but not as much as the statins can achieve. Uh, it's a prodrug. So it has to be activated in the liver, which means that nothing happens in muscle. So it's pretty difficult to, for it to produce a musculoskeletal adverse effect when it really doesn't even get into muscle. Um, it has a very strong anti-inflammatory effect. And this has been seen in multiple trials. Now um, in the clear outcomes trial, which will be you know, presented and published sometime soon, uh, uh, the effect on CRP was not factored into the powering of the trial. It's a bonus. And here's the question to be asked is, are the results going to fall off of the cholesterol treatment trialist collaborative 
uh, regression line. Is it going to be above the line or about below the line? If it's below the line, it means that there's more effect than would be predicted for the LDL lowering. Now, we hope it's more than, for example, was seen in Improve It. You know, the Improve It trial went on for seven years and got a 6% reduction in morbidity and mortality. It wasn't very impressive. Um, you know, we're hoping to see a lot better than that. Um, this issue of statin intolerance, as we've talked about, is very controversial. There are people, particularly in the UK, that say it doesn't exist. Uh, people like me that work in a prevention clinic see people every day that have tried multiple statins and have adverse effects. The, the trials that have done been done looking for a nocebo effect have suggested that it really isn't real. But we did a trial called Gauss-3 that showed that probably as many as half of the people with well-documented statin intolerance do in fact have objective evidence of statin intolerance. And it's a complicated study design. It's in JAMA. Everybody can read it. The bottom line is, if a patient looks us in the eye and says, Dr. Nissen, Dr. Taub, I will not take a statin. I've tried them and I cannot tolerate them. What are we gonna do? We need alternatives. We have PCSK9 inhibitors, they're potent, they're expensive, they're injectable, they work very well. Bempedoic acid fills in that gap between PCSK9 inhibitors and not doing anything. It has you know, good LDL lowering effect, good anti-inflammatory effect, no increase in blood sugar. And you know, we're very hopeful that uh, when studied, uh, when the clear outcome trial is done, that we'll, we'll see that it has a, uh, a clinical benefit on morbidity and mortality. One thing that I'm very excited about with clear outcomes is you have over 50% women in your trial. Congratulations on that because it's really important for us to have a more, a better representation of women and minorities in our clinical trials. We have worked extremely hard to do that. And, you know, and by the way, I know you're on some executive committees, all the executive committees now that I'm forming, we're putting, we're trying to have 50% women on the executive committee. There are lots of really talented women coming up in cardiology. They just need to be given an opportunity. And so, you know, in the last, you know, decade of my career, I'm going to be an enabler. And boy, have I met some fantastic women in the course of this who really deserve to be where they are. And we're going to give them an opportunity to lead in these trials. Well, congratulations, because I think clear outcomes is really going to set the, the precedence for how all trials should be with enrollment of women. So congratulations. Do you, what do you think are the mechanisms of statin intolerance? Oh my goodness, you know, it's a $64,000 question. You know, I just, you know, I've looked at it. Paul Thompson and I have talked about it. He's kind of one of the gurus of all this. I just don't think we understand, you know, CoQ10 didn't work, you know, in a randomized trial. So that's clearly depletion of CoQ10 is not the mechanism. I don't know. Do you have a hypothesis, Pam? I think it's something with the mitochondria. Yeah. I do know that patients who have statin intolerance have lower levels of coenzyme Q10, at least at the cellular level. Yes. It has been translated in the clinical trials, but that is involved. We also know that mitochondria are really important for metabolism and blood glucose levels. So I, I do think that statins somehow impact mitochondrial function. And we also see that People who are very athletic, who take statins, will yes. support a small decrease in VO2 max. And Paul Thompson has actually published a paper in Jack a few years on that and changes in citrate synthase levels in, in the mitochondria. So I think there is a mitochondrial mechanism that we have to understand better. Yeah. One more point, and that is that people have to be very careful that they rule out other causes for statin intolerance. I can't tell you people I've seen that say, I can't take statins, but you then you check their thyroid and their hypothyroid. You correct their thyroid, their hypothyroidism, and they now tolerate the statins. So, you know, there's some things to be done. People need to be thoughtful about this 
before declaring the patient statin intolerant. By the way, in our clear outcomes trial, patients and providers have to sign a statement that they understand that statins are the gold standard for reduction in morbidity and mortality, and the patients have to declare that they will not take a statin under any circumstances. So we're doing this in what we think is a very ethical way to make sure that we're getting people who really truly will not take a statin. And if patients won't take a statin, we're gonna to have to provide them with an alternative. Yeah. Similar to thyroid, the other thing to check is vitamin D. I find yeah, that with optimized vitamin D, a lot of statin intolerance goes away. Well, finally, let's talk about the latest LDL lowering agent, which is enclycerin. And I've started to use it in my clinical practice. What, what do you think the role of enclycerin is in the whole armamentarium we have now of LDL lowering therapies? Well, it is really a remarkable drug. And uh, we've been investigating a number of, of short interfering RNAs that are uh, in other, have other targets. But enclycerin is really uh, almost the ideal PCSK9 inhibitor in my view. You can give it twice a year. Patient comes in to see it twice a year. Uh, you know, the, the nurse in the office gives them their shot. You know, you know that they're taking the drug. There's no compliance issue. I know you know this, and I think many of our, of our, our viewers know this, but the average duration of a statin prescription in America is nine months. And, you know, we just can't keep people on daily oral meds very effectively. But if we can get them to see us and give them their shot twice a year, it's almost like a vaccine against cholesterol and get a 50% reduction in LDL, then I'm gonna sleep better at night knowing that patient is really getting the treatment that they most, most need. So I'm very excited about enclycerin and I, I wished I hadn't had to wait so long for it to be approved by FDA. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us and really giving us your insights into the space where you've really pioneered so many areas. I mean, using IVIS to understand mechanistically what's going on in, in the coronary plaque and all the clinical trials that you've been involved with have really changed our clinical practice. So just a pleasure to be with you and get your insights today. Thank you. And I enjoyed it very much, Pam.